our two presenters for today. Um, so first is Ashley Currenting, um, who is a public health specialist, a food allergy advocate, um, and a member of FAIR's Rising Leaders. Uh, she received her master's for public health as well as her bachelor of science in community health from George Mason University's honors program. Um, she has owned and operated two businesses, Rise and Thrive and AK Learning Institute. Um, and I'm really thrilled to have her with us today. And presenting alongside her, we have Sarah Klein, who is FAIR's Director of Strategic Insights. Sarah is responsible for really ensuring that the voices of people with food allergies remain at the heart of FAIR's initiatives. Um, she leads research initiatives for FAIR uh, that will help to better inform our policies. She received her MBA from NYU Stern School of Business and her BA in Sociology from Boston University. And Sarah brings her insight as a food allergy advocate um, and a food allergy mom into her daily work at FAIR um, and certainly into this webinar. So I will hand it over to both Sarah and Ashley now for Food Allergies Are My Superpower, Using Your Skills to Empower Yourself and Others. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much, Claire. Kelly. Really appreciate the warm welcome. Thank you all for joining us today also. Um, like Kelly stated, my name is Ashley B. Crunting, and um, I'm really excited to speak to you all today. So anytime that I'm speaking about food allergies, I always like to start with a little bit of storytelling. I think people get to know you a little bit more when you share your background. You're able to kind of follow your journey from start to where you are now. So here we have two photos of me. I think the one on the left, maybe I was or so, and the one on the right, I was just a little bit younger. Um, I think the photo on the right is really funny because it kind of relates to my relationship with food, loved eating it, sometimes picky, um, but still a food person to this day. Um, just to talk a little bit more about my food allergy story, I started out having an allergy to peanuts. So my mom is a nurse, and when I was younger, my brother loved eating peanut butter, she used to take us to Chick-fil-A all the time. And she said there was one time when my brother had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I think I may have had a little bit of it. And she saw that I started throwing up. She saw that I had a little bit of a rash. So she thought, hmm, Ashley might have peanut allergies. And then when she took me to the doctor, I was diagnosed with peanut allergies. I believe I was two years old. As I got older, um, elementary school age, I was diagnosed with an oat allergy, a milk allergy, peanuts, and now tree nut allergies. Then as time progressed a little bit, this was around middle school, it, my, I outgrew my oat allergy, I outgrew my milk allergy, and the doctors diagnosed me with peanuts, tree nuts, and my new one was soy. And then currently where I am at now, um, peanuts, tree nuts, milk, soy, lima beans, halibut, and sesame. And all of those stay consistent uh, for the most part, peanuts, tree nuts, soy, up until high school. Then early college is when milk return, lima beans, halibut, and sesame is truly my newest allergy. So I say all that to say I felt confused. It was tough at times. It's hard to have eaten things, then not eat them, then try to go back to eating them. Um, aside from the piece of just trying to make sense of it for yourself. It's also just a bit mentally exhausting. So it was just something I kind of went through and that was my food allergy story as it relates to what I was diagnosed with. Oh, I'm sorry. So I also wanted to go into growing up with food allergies a little bit. I know that the audience is very broad today. We have some parents, we have um, some young adults, some teens, so many different um, groups of people, some caretakers. So just a little bit about my experience and how I grew up, how my food allergies were managed. So photo on the left is me. It was my brother's birthday. I'm with my aunt. And then the photo on the right is me in kindergarten. And I really vividly remember my kindergarten experience with my food allergies because I recognized how different I was from other people in that school setting. So PM kindergarten, they would have milk and cookies for the kids during snack time. I remember I had juice and fruit 
And that was just a, a core memory of mine, remembering that everybody had something else and I had my one specific um, thing that I could safely have. In terms of how my food allergies were managed, my parents did pretty much all the work. Um, my teachers also did pretty much all the work. I would go to school. The teachers knew what I was allergic to. They knew the plan. My mom had the medications in the nurse's office or in my classroom. Um, when I was at home, same thing. Everyone in my household knew what I was allergic to. They knew what to not give me, what to give me. Everything was separated in my house. My brother would have like peanut bars and granola bars that he would take to school, but they would be wrapped, put in his lunchbox separately, stored somewhere different. So I say all that to say when I was growing up, I didn't manage my food allergies really at all. It was all done for me. Everyone spoke for me. Um, my mom did try to push me. And my dad tried to encourage, hey, you know, when we go to this restaurant, try to explain to them. And I very strongly refused. Um, I was not interested in doing that. I was very used to everybody speaking for me and taking care of things for me. So I just wanted to keep it that way. It was hard for me to vocalize certain things and share those certain things. So that's a little bit about how I um, grew up and how Everything was really managed for me. It kind of continued into middle school as well. I believe at the end of middle school is when some regulations came out where epinephrine was going to be housed in the nurse's office. They'd have a two pack. So aside from the two pack that your parent would bring in, they also had one at the school. And then over time they were housed in the classrooms. And I believe that happened in high school. So a lot of times as I was experiencing all of that, I kind of looked at things in the way of, I can't do a lot of things. So I would tell myself, okay, I, I can't really participate in this, in this class party, or I can't go here, or if my mom isn't here, I can't do this. And my dad had really great conversations with me as I was growing up, helping me and encouraging me to look at it from the perspective of what can I do? What are some things that with my allergies, I'm still able to do because he always emphasized that I'm able to live a fulfilling life. I'm able to live a full life. Anything my brother was able to do, I could also do. I might need to approach it a little bit differently, um, but there are definitely ways to navigate around it. And I always like to tell myself now, instead of looking at it from a can't perspective, what can I do? So I'm also a really big quote person love quotes, love all of the corny quotes, all of the quote of the day kind of things. Um, that's just been something that has really helped me. I love words in general. So a quote by Brendan Burchard that I really love is, I'm not interested in your limiting beliefs. I'm interested in what makes you limitless. I think a lot of times when you're someone who is allergic to food, whether it's one or multiple, or you have a child that's allergic to food or a friend, um, we tend to think about all of the things that limit us. People tend to put labels on us, right? It could be, oh, she's just the girl allergic to milk, or she's just the girl allergic to nuts, or, oh yeah, she's just the girl with all the allergies. But we are so much more than that. And instead of allowing those labels and um, those things that people say, especially people who don't understand it completely, to limit us, it's really good to approach it and look at it in a way of what makes me limitless. Where are places that I can go where I can just feel free and I'm able to you know, try everything? Um, what are some food allergy friendly uh, new products that are out that'll make my child feel like you know they're limitless, they're able to participate in this, or they're able to participate in all types of things. So I think instead of allowing others to define us, uh, we have to look at ourselves and we have to think, how do I view myself? Uh, so I just wanna do a quick little exercise with you all. I want you all to think of only one word to describe yourself. Maybe give yourself a minute or two. If you'd like to share it in the chat, I would love to see that word. Um, I don't know if maybe Kelly, if you are able to maybe share some of the words that people are sharing, if they would like to share in the chat. 
but feel free to think about it, write it down, or post it in the chat and let me know what's that one word that you would use to describe yourself. I love some of these that are coming in. The first one, one that I saw was amazing. It was dynamic. Um, shine is coming through. Uh, honest, loyal, empathetic, caring, resilient, observant, protective, happy, mm -hmm. brave, fearless, spunky, um, <laughs> genuine, energy, perseverant, happy, unique, reliable, a learner strong, creative. I could go on, so I will hand it back to you, but these are um, amazing, undefinable, confident. I love these. I love that. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you all for sharing. And for the person that said undefinable, you, you hit the nail on the head because I did kind of give you all a trick question. I don't think there's only one word to describe us. Um, I think there's, we're all so multifaceted we're multi-talented, we're all unique. Um, one word, using one word to describe yourself, I think would be doing yourself a disservice. All of the words you all shared are amazing and they're definitely a part of who you are, but they're not all of who you are. Um, so when I think about this, I think to myself, who am I? <clears throat> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I think it just skipped a little bit. One second. All right, perfect. Sorry about that. So I like to think, who am I? Um, like I talked about earlier with those labels, especially growing up with food allergies, um, for teens, for children, it can sometimes be hard. It can um, sometimes have an effect on their mental health to think that I'm only defined by my allergies or the only way people recognize me or think of me is because of my allergy. But we always have to think about the fact that we are so much more than that. Having a food allergy or navigating life with food allergies is a piece of our story, but it's not the whole story. So I like to look at myself and I say, who am I? I went to George Mason University. I'm a graduate of there. If anybody went there, go Patriot. Um, then there's a photo of me, my mom, and my grandma when she turned 90. I'm a huge family person. I love family, and I love engaging with my family. In the middle is a photo of me and my girls. I coach girls basketball, so I'm a coach. Um, and then there's just more photos of my family coaching, me speaking, doing things that I love. So there are so many different things that make us who we are, and I think it's always good to Look at yourself and think about the fact that, yes, I have food allergies or yes, my child has food allergies, but frequently reminding your child or yourself that you're so much more than that. Um, so I'm going to pause here and I'm going to, let me see, I apologize. I think this, um, Sorry, I apologize. I'm experiencing some technical difficulties today, but I, I have one more and then I'm gonna pause and hand it over to Sarah, who will um, be sharing some great pieces of information in regards to her market research with FAIR and her experience as a food allergy mom. So just to kind of wrap it up um, in talking about how we're viewing ourselves and just to kind of talk to the different audiences that are on today. There are so many different parts that make us who we are. And then we also experience different things through different life stages. So navigating life with food allergies is going to look different for an elementary age child than it is for a middle school or high school age child. It's going to look different when your child is in high school or when you're in high school versus when you're in college. So just to speak on a few pieces of how I navigated differently, high school was the one time that I started managing my food allergies myself. I played basketball and I ran track. We would go to meets. I would have my snacks with me. And um, that was difficult for me. I think I shared with you all beforehand, my parents really managed everything for me. And now having to learn to sometimes speak up, honestly, not always doing a good job of it, um, was really, really tough but I was still able to get through it. I was able to have a great high school experience. 
I was able to have conversations like, okay, let me talk to my friends um, when they're picking a restaurant for homecoming. Let me talk to my friends about our plans for prom when we're picking a restaurant. Those are all things to consider. Then I went to college. College, there were different um, things that I had to navigate there. I experienced the dining hall, cooking on campus. Um, the dining hall was a tough experience for me freshman year because I was still a bit uncomfortable with advocating for myself. But for anyone who is about to be in college or parents who have children about to go to college, I would definitely recommend looking for the campus dietitian. They are available to everyone who um, is a student there and it's included within your tuition. My dietitian was able to look at all of the resources and all of the meats and vegetables and grains that were shipped to the school at certain weeks and create my own schedule for me and create different foods that I could have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It was down to the point that, you know, every week she was emailing me and my parents, letting them know, hey, this is what we're going to be serving, Ashley. They would make my food downstairs in a different kitchen and then bring it up to me. And I was really happy to see that over time, um, after people saw, hey, why is somebody bringing you food separately? I would meet other people in the dining hall who were like, I also had allergies. I didn't know I could eat that or I didn't know that was a thing. And more and more people started vocalizing the fact that they had food allergies themselves to, until we got to the point where they created a simple serving station in our dining hall, which is a top eight um, free station with all different utensils, all different pots and pans, allergy trained chefs um, and support staff. So now we were able to go into the dining hall, go to that specific station. They had a different menu every day and were able to just kind of more peacefully eat in the dining hall. Um, but then, you know, you move on and graduate from college. There's the space of being a young professional. I'm now traveling for work speaking at cool things like the fair summit, um, you know, getting on planes and having work conferences. So that's a new thing where you have to vocalize these things to your boss, to your team members, um, to the people around you. And then one thing that I was really proud of, um, because it really took me a long time to get there, was independent travel, being comfortable enough to travel without my parents, without my family, with my friends. And being able to figure out um, how to navigate my food allergies in different places. So this was us in Vegas. And Vegas was honestly great for food allergies in terms of finding restaurants online beforehand, calling ahead, reaching out to them, um, finding places where if you needed to, you could cook something within your room or navigate it that way. And then there's the independent living piece. I know some parents are you know, concerned about my child is getting ready to move off of the college campus, right? The college campus, once you get there, you kind of get into this space where you're comfortable with everything, right? I said I had a schedule, the dietitian took care of it. I knew all of the staff. Then you move on to a different life stage and it's like starting over again. So how do you navigate that? Um, and I'm really happy to say community and people like FAIR and other communities of um, people who have food allergies have really helped me to be able to get through all of these life stages and continue to go through life as a young professional, as someone who has food allergies. And I just wanted to share that to let everybody know that it can be done. You know, I know it can be daunting and sometimes tough when your child's in elementary school and you're figuring all of this out. But as time goes on, there's so many new advancements, products, technologies here to help us. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Sarah and let her continue. Thank you, Ashley. So my role at FAIR is to conduct market research to understand our community, especially when it comes to behaviors and attitudes. I look at differences within our community, but also patterns and trends. And as a food allergy mom, I see a lot of similarities between how people say they feel in our research and how I feel myself. So what have I learned about our community? Um, Ashley, I don't think I have control. Thank you. 
there we go. So what have I learned? For one thing, we do a lot of worrying. We worry every time we or our kids eat something new. And when our kids eat without us or without a trusted grown-up who can use an EpiPen, we worry when we go to restaurants and when we go to parties. And we worry when we think about treatments, and that includes short-term treatments like Benadryl and epinephrine. And it also includes long-term treatments like OIT. And the worry doesn't go away just because we've made a decision. We continue to worry. I also know from the research that our kids feel a lot of the same worry as we do. And as parents, that doesn't feel very good because we don't like for our kids to feel that way. In addition, managing a food allergy really impacts every aspect of our lives. It impacts where we go, who we eat with. We don't trust a lot of people to cook for us. We don't trust a lot of restaurants. In our community, most of us say we have less than five safe restaurants. And we feel a lot of stress at social events with family and with friends, which is a time when we'd really like to be able to just enjoy ourselves. So with all of that, when this topic of superpowers related to food allergy came up, I wasn't entirely sure that I could take it on because I wasn't sure that I really have any superpowers. And I mentioned it to my husband and I said, what do you think? Do you think there's anything about me that's a superhero? And I was so surprised by his response because he said, yes, every day you are a superhero. Every time we have a happy kid at a birthday party where she can't eat any of the food, you are a superhero. He said, you actually have a lot of superhero moments. So that got me thinking, and I went back to all of my data, and I started looking at it through the lens of trying to identify our actual superpowers, and I found a lot. Having a food allergy requires a superhero's level of diligence. We check every label every time, probably multiple times. And if you're like me, you have probably pulled packages out of the garbage for one final check just to be totally sure that it's safe. We also make sure that epinephrine is always on hand. And that's a superhero ability because for any medical condition that requires management, compliance is really hard for patients and caregivers. I have seen numbers ranging from 30% to 70% when it comes to compliance. But for food allergy, you need to be compliant 100% of the time. And we're all targeting that. We also bring our own food with us to parties and on vacation. These are occasions where if you don't have a food allergy, you can probably relax and enjoy having someone else's delicious food. But that's often not an option for us food allergy families. And a lot of times we go above and beyond to make that food we bring look and feel special. We're also working hard to create safe environments particularly at schools and extracurricular events. And a lot of our community is working hard to create safe environments even more broadly around the country, whether through advocacy for laws or improving education among the public. So next I went out and I did another small study. I asked our community, is there anything you think that's good about having a food allergy? anything that you have learned, or any way it's made your life better? And I was a little bit nervous to ask this question because I didn't want anyone to feel like I was being unsympathetic. But I was really astonished at the overwhelmingly positive responses I received. So here's what the community told me. First, whoops. Um, not sure what's happening here. Okay. First, we eat healthier. We eat less processed foods and we do more cooking from scratch. 
We cook with our children and cooking sometimes becomes a fun hobby. We are also much more informed in general about the food we eat and what's really in it. And this can have a positive impact on the entire family's overall diet and health. Second, we are more compassionate. We realize that everyone is facing something unique in their lives. I'll call out a few of these quotes, which I really love. My son used to ask, why me? But now his eyes have opened and he is able to see we are all different and all have different limitations. My kid with food allergy and his brothers are always looking out for each other with food allergies and in general. I'm more mindful of others. I am more aware of general accessibility issues. I have more empathy. I always think about everyone's unique situations and how to be inclusive food allergy or not. These quotes really resonate with me because I feel this way too. Before I started this food allergy journey, I was guilty of being a little bit skeptical about other people's stories or thinking that I had the ability to make assumptions with only a little bit of information. But now I know that I really have no idea what's going on in anyone else's life. And most likely they're dealing with their own concerns, which I know nothing about. We are also grateful for the others in our lives. We have a real food allergy community. We realize the impact we have on others and the way others can impact us. We see there are people who are willing to go out of their way for us to keep us safe or just to make us feel happy. This is another one that really resonates with me and I wouldn't have called it out without seeing this input, but it makes me think about my aunt who cleaned out an entire section of her kitchen and filled it with safe food for my daughter. It also makes me think about the restaurant waiters, waitresses, and managers who have just gone above and beyond from hauling out enormous packages for me to see the ingredient labels or on their own Googled allergen labeling policies for their vendors. And we have life skills. We juggle our lives with additional food safety requirements. We are prepared resilient, we advocate for ourselves and for our children, and we are self-aware. These skills are important for everyone, regardless of whether or not you manage a food allergy. I decided to collect one additional data point. My daughter Hannah is seven years old, and I asked her whether she thought she had any special powers or anything that was actually good about having a food allergy. I asked her if she wanted to say these things herself on this webinar, but she was a little bit intimidated. So I wrote down everything she told me. Now, before I get into what she actually told me, I have to say that this was such a lovely conversation and she surprised me so much with her answers that I would suggest anyone with kids have the same discussion at home. So first she said she eats better food. Now she's seven, so she isn't thinking in terms of being healthy. She means she gets yummy, fresh food all the time. She told me her favorite is the fresh bread I make. And I have to say thank you to the New York Times for their speedy, easy bread recipe there, which I make because we have not found any bakery safe bread for her. She also likes her dad's cheesecake. She said, you can always go to the store and buy a cheesecake, but daddy's cheesecake is fresh. She also said, people do special things for me. Since she can't have everything at restaurants, they make her food separate and special for her. When we are eating as a family, we always try to make sure that all of the food on the table is safe for her. She said, it makes me feel happy that I can eat everything my family eats. 
And she also said that she thinks kids with food allergies should say thank you. She says she wants to say thank you to her mom and dad because we keep her safe and we make sure she has good food and it's very sweet of us. I think this is her way of saying she feels her parents' love, she sees it in action, and she's grateful. So when I consider all of the information that I have in my hands, from the research, from my personal experience, it makes me realize that the food allergy community has many, many superpowers. I would like to call out just a few of the ones which I have observed. First of all, I see the ability to self-advocate as a real superpower. We and our kids do this every single day. Every time we make an action plan for school, every time we ask a restaurant about their ability to accommodate, and I would be remiss if I did not also acknowledge the amazing advocacy work, which has come from my colleagues at FAIR, the broader food allergy community, and especially young adults like Ashley and others who are making a real difference. Whenever my daughter expresses a negative feeling about her food allergy, I always remind her that there are people working every single day to make life better for people with food allergies. For my family personally, we had to have a legal battle with our public school to obtain a 504 and accommodations. It was a terribly stressful experience, but in the end, it taught my kids and myself that we can make things happen. We can stand up for ourselves. We can be our own advocates. I looked up the definition of self-advocacy, and it's really about knowing your rights and being able to ask for what you want and need. And I think the food allergy community and our kids are forced to learn this. We need to know our rights and we need to be able to speak up for ourselves and for others. It's tough and it's a development process, but I really think that this is a life skill which carries on to many other areas. The next superpower I have observed is being extremely responsible. Personally, as a working mom with a kid who has food allergies, I'm managing more than I thought was possible with everything that needs to be checked, remembered, and prepared in advance. It requires and it fosters diligence and responsibility among our kids. I see that kids with food allergies are more aware of their environments and their bodies than a lot of other kids their age. In my family, we put our daughter in charge of informing grown-ups about her allergy starting at the age of three. We would go to birthday parties and bring her own dessert. And I told her that she had to be responsible for telling the food servers that she could not eat the food because she had an allergy. Now, naturally, I was watching very closely for safety, and the food servers were usually completely bewildered when they heard a three-year-old say, I can't have the food, I have an allergy. They often didn't know what to do, but my daughter did know what to do. She would say, my mom has my food, she will bring it. And I think that experience has actually been really good for my daughter because it's taught her that the grown-ups around her don't always know best or what's safe or that she has an allergy. And at the end of the day, she is responsible for keeping herself safe. Of course, we're very protective and careful as a family, but I do think that having a food allergy has taught her this life lesson much earlier than a lot of other kids. The last superpower I want to mention is being inclusive. People with food allergies know what it's like to be excluded, sometimes to be physically excluded, physically separated from others, sitting at a separate table, or not able to touch the same things as others. My daughter's school won't let her touch the water fountain or shared paintbrushes, 
because they're worried about allergens. Last weekend, she had to skip a birthday party because it involved cooking food and they just couldn't find a way to make it safe for her. She tells me how this makes her feel left out. And while I never want her to feel this way, and we work very hard to make sure she feels included, I do see a silver lining in this experience, and that is that she naturally recognizes when someone is feeling excluded. She realizes it much more quickly than the rest of us do. And sometimes she realizes it when the rest of us don't see it at all. And I think that's because we are just not as in tune with how it feels. A specific example I can give from my family is when we went to an amusement park that had height requirements for the different rides. We had planned to split up based on who could ride what, and if you weren't tall enough for a ride, then you would just go on a different ride. My food allergic daughter would not have that. She was adamant that no one should go on any ride that the shortest person in the group could not go on. It hadn't even really occurred to us that this might be a big deal to anyone, but I'm sure that it's because my food allergic daughter knows very well how bad it can feel to be left out, especially for something that's completely out of your control. We know that it's important to be inclusive, and I really believe that our kids with food allergy have such a stronger sense of how to do this and also how to do it the right way. And now I'll pass things back from uh, to Ashley to conclude. So just kind of to sum it up, um, everything that Sarah shared in terms of those silver linings of the experience with navigating life with food allergies, I think are really key points to keep in mind and really great things to, like she said, share with your children and frequently keep reminding them about. When I look at my experience with navigating food allergies, I always like to frequently encourage myself because I think along this journey, there are times and days where sometimes it's just like, okay, this is really tough, or I really did a lot today, I advocated for myself today, and this person just didn't get it. Um, but there are some really key things that people with food allergies and only people that are navigating life like this have. And they are amazing skills, amazing um, traits to have just that will help not only within this journey, but with so many other things, whether it's college, whether it's athletics, whether it's career. Um, so I kind of created some affirmations that I say to myself and things that I like to remind myself of that frequently continue to encourage me and help me. So I say I am statements, but as I'm speaking to you all, I will say you are statements. And as I'm sharing this, feel free to take a photo of it. Feel free to jot it down. Um, say it with your child, say it to yourself. But I always like to say, first off, you are intelligent. Navigating life with food allergies, you know, we read ingredients and are able to tell someone that a super long name is a sugar derived from this or is a protein derived from this. And most of my friends are like, how did you know that? I, I've never realized that before, but we, we really have no choice but to be intelligent because of how we're able to navigate and look at labels and contact restaurants. We're also innovative. You know, um, I grew up having a milk allergy and my mom was still able to find ways to create dairy-free mac and cheese for me. I was able to find dairy-free cheese and have ham and cheese sandwiches. That's innovative. You know, we are able to make foods that traditionally have certain ingredients we're able to remove those ingredients and make them safe for us, make them delicious, make other people who don't even have food allergies enjoy them. We are also wonderful advocates, and you're a wonderful advocate, not just for yourself, but for others. Um, similar to what Sarah said, people who have food allergies or are aware of this experience tend to be the same people that will speak up when they see someone else being treated unfairly or treated poorly in a situation that has nothing to do with. We're also courageous. We 
go on vacation, you all take your kids to different places, different countries, um, and you're able to be courageous, put them in that new situation, put yourself in that new situation, and still navigate it successfully. We're able to go places, talk to restaurants, call ahead, plan ahead. Um, that kind of ties into us being disciplined. You know, I have friends who will sometimes say, hey, I'm going on a 21 day juice cleanse and three days in they're like, oh, I messed up. I'm eating the chips already. Um, but, you know, for us, for people who have food allergies, we're disciplined when we say that, hey, I'm going to set my mind to do this. We're able to do it because every single day we avoid our allergens every single day. Um, we plan ahead. We're disciplined in that. There's never been a trip, um, a day, any kind of events that you go to that you haven't had to plan ahead or think ahead for it. Um, and I say all that to say, you know, you are uniquely you and you're going to live an amazing, fun and fulfilling life. There's no reason that we should feel as though because we have food allergies, we can't enjoy our lives. We have to enjoy our lives and we will be able to enjoy our lives. We are also equipped to handle anything that comes our way. You know, I think most people's day to day they don't experience the things that we experience. So just knowing that you've been able to successfully navigate all of those things, whether it's for yourself or for your child, you're here today and you're able to still keep doing it, that lets you know and should let you know that anything that comes your way, you're gonna be able to do it. And just wanted to end this off with a quote. Um, this is a quote from me, because like I told you all, I love quotes. And this was something that when I had spoke to teens, I shared with them. And I told them that as a person with food allergies, you're a part of an exclusive and amazing club, a club that is full of uniquely skilled people. We have skills that people are, are fighting really hard to build, you know, similar to what Sarah was talking about with her three year old. There are elementary age children that are advocating for themselves, for others that have you know, discipline that's gonna take them so far. Um, we have so many skills and we have this beautiful community where we can continue to encourage ourselves and continue to encourage others um, just to know that you know, things will be okay. We're gonna find out ways to work around certain things that may be tough and that you know, we're part of this amazing club and we have so many amazing skills because of it. So again, I really wanted to thank you all for joining us. Um, we would love to hear from you. My information and Sarah's information is on the screen. Feel free to reach out if you have questions for us. And Sarah, did you wanna say any closing words? Just thank you all for joining and for being a part of the FAIR community. Well, thank you so much to Sarah and Ashley. I know we've gotten a couple of questions in the Q&A, so I would, I would love to kind of follow up to that wonderful presentation. I think so much of what both of you said resonated to lots of people um, in the chat, especially Sarah, some of the uh, throwing away the food labels and picking through the garbage, guilty as charged over here too. Um, one of the things that I think you, you know, you guys kind of had talking, you were talking about throughout this whole presentation is kind of how and when to advocate for yourself. So Ashley, you having kind of been through it and Sarah, you guiding your daughter, what would you guys recommend um, as the time to start allowing your child to advocate for themselves? So I would love to hear your thoughts on it. I know I have my own with my son, but would love to hear what you guys think. Certainly every family is different. In my family, it worked, you know, starting for my daughter really at age three, and I would just say, you're in charge. And same with um, telling people about her allergies, but also now that she's seven and my husband is constantly forgetting her EpiPens, even though they're kept by the door with the keys, he walks right out the door with his keys and no EpiPen. And so I've started telling my daughter, listen, daddy doesn't remember. So you have to remember. And she actually has started, you know, really taking that on for herself. And I'd like my husband to remember <laughs> at the end of the day, she's the one who's going to have to remember for herself when she's, you know, independent and on her own. So I would say it's never too early to start encouraging it. Ashley, and any thoughts? 
Yeah, I was going to say I, I agree with what Sarah said. Um, like I had shared earlier, my mom really did try to start that with me at an early age, and I had a very hard time with it. I just was not really willing um, to practice speaking up for myself. So I think definitely starting at an early age and, you know, keep trying um, as a parent. My mom kept trying with me and eventually I, I got it right. And now I'm able to speak to people about it, even on webinars like this, which I think young me would not have imagined that. So definitely keep trying. And like Sarah said, you're, it's never too early to start. And I think that's right. Like, certainly it's when your own child is developmentally and socially ready for that. And I think that we all do things that, and, and Sarah, you just pointed this out and it reminded me of what I did. My son's now 11. And when he was younger, he certainly was not ready to advocate for himself, but I would make a point, And I still do of every time that we leave the house, I will say to someone, do we have the EpiPen? And it's not out of anxiety. It's out of teaching him that we don't leave the house until we do that. So that even in and of itself, he might not be advocating for himself, but it's teaching the lessons to advocate down the road. So I think we're all doing that. Um, and then it is really listening to when your child is ready to kind of take on that role. And I think for many of us, it does come at a restaurant or the first time that they're alone that you hear of something um, that your child said. And, you know, that's the uh, proud moment. And I'm sure, Ashley, your your family is feeling that um, all of the time. Um, moving and switching gears a little bit, because there were a lot of questions in the chat, really just kind of honing in on some of the things you said. So Ashley, not to get too deep into the weeds, but I think something that a couple of people reflected on is you mentioning kind of getting on a plane. Um, do you have any just top tips and tricks for traveling um, on a plane and what you do to keep yourself safe? Yeah, so for me, um, I've been more specific with airlines, um, especially now traveling solo. That's uh, probably in the past, four to five years new experience for me because I frequently traveled with family. Um, I like to make sure that I'm looking up the airline's allergy policy. I always like to also reach out to their accessibility office and see if it can be listed on my boarding pass. Um, when I get to the airport and I'm going to the gate, I also like to talk to the people about at the gate. And regardless of what number or order they have me boarding, I like to ask, hey, is there any way I can pre-board? Um, make sure I go and wipe down uh, the area that I'm going to be in. And then I also like to continue to reiterate that with the flight attendant and the staff when I'm on the plane. And I've had really, really good experiences where, you know, I would say, hey, is there any way you can let the people around me know that, you know, I have allergies, if they could please refrain from eating nuts on this um, plane. And you know, I was shocked. I just recently went with my family to California and we flew into SFO and they made an announcement on the plane like multiple times. <laughs> and I was not expecting them to make a plane wide announcement, but just in being able to talk to them, having shared it at the gate, having it try to mark it on my boarding pass then saying it again when I got there as different groups were boarding, they kept sharing the announcement. And it was just a super amazing experience for me. It really put me at ease. Um, and I like to kind of try to keep flying those same airlines that have been really receptive to that. Yeah, I think I, I was traveling solo, um, which happens rarely a couple of weeks ago. And I heard um, the announcement overhead about someone with a peanut allergy, and it warmed my heart because I just was so happy to see you know, how the airline had responded. Um, for us traveling with a young child on a plane, I always just, you know, it is about that whole planning um, that everyone kind of talked about today that we are, we are people who plan. So I make it a point to plan his, you know, meals or snacks for the plane and know what we're doing. And, and I remember the first time we flew post COVID and my son saw other people wiping down their seats on the plane. 
And he said, wow, now everybody does this. And I'm like, yeah, but we were the first. <laughs> so, you know, again, planning and allergy families, I think is great, but tips and tricks for planes. I certainly think letting the airline know, and then, you know, packing and being prepared, I think, and obviously having all of your meds on your body um, and not packing them. And, and I always just pack extra just so that I have them um, and that I can feel secure on that plane. Um, again, switching gears, um, a question that came in was actually, you know, looking at a camp situation, but Sarah, I would love your input on, it was asking about how kids in a line getting food, what can the camp do or the food, you know, servers do to be a little bit more discreet in handing kids food? But it also, there was a secondary part of it that basically said, but how comfortable are kids with sharing the idea that they have food allergies? So is this something that we need to do? So I would love your input on for your, you know, young daughter, how people have been discreet, but then also how easily you feel like she's willing to share. So for us, my daughter is um, very sensitive. She doesn't need to eat the foods to have a reaction. So we have, at least up until this point, taken the approach that we're not concerned about privacy because the risk of her coming in of accidental contact is too great. Um, I wish I had an answer for how to be discreet. I can tell you at my daughter's camp, she has like a specially marked plate that so it is very clear she has different food from everybody else and that is done to keep her safe but I do think that's actually something that you know I would love to explore in my role at fair as you know for people who aren't comfortable sharing you know that information because it is private information and not everybody wants to go around sharing that what are the ways that you can stay safe um, yeah, no, that is such a great point. And I think I've heard of people wearing bracelets. Um, you know, I think that that is something that I've certainly seen to be discreet. And, and I agree. I mean, I think lots of kids get to that point of there are people who know about their food allergies, and that's something that really keeps them safe um, within their own environments, having people know. Um, just in the interest of time, um, I will kind of ask one more question, um, which had to do with safety at school. Um, and this you know, will actually be its own webinar in the next few months in the summer, so look out for that. But you know, if you have the you know, quick bites on the things that either of you have done to kind of keep safe at school? Um, and what could you tell our listeners? Yeah, so um, I can go first. I'll kind of speak on like a high school, college perspective, and I'll let Sarah kind of speak to what she's doing with her daughter. Um, I think in high school, especially if your child is doing sports, you know, looking ahead, coordinating with the coach to see, if, you know, if they have snacks or, team fruit and bars if there's any way that you can either suggest certain brands or anything of that sort i know when i coach i get all the allergies ahead of time i share the brands with the parents and make sure that they know hey this is what i'm providing for the team does this work and make sure all of that is clear beforehand um, i think also when you get to the college level looking into your dining hall and the provider I know there's like Aramark and there's Dexo, um, learning about the brands that go into the dining hall, um, what options are available to your child, thinking about breakfast, lunch, and dinner um, and the different foods that they will be able to have. And then making sure that you're meeting with the campus dietitian or a chef in the dining hall, um, having a joint meeting, sitting down, discussing it with them and having a plan, I think is the way to go because every college campus is different. Some college campuses now have set dining halls that are just for um, students that have food allergies. Some have stations. Some haven't got to that point yet. So food needs to be made separately in separate areas. So just having those kind of conversations with my tips. From, I'll go really quickly from my perspective, for us, the things that we felt we really needed to keep our child safe in school the 504 plan to make sure that everyone was on the same page and going to follow the rules. EpiPen in the classroom, following my child at all times. 
and also someone designated to use the EpiPen at all times with backups, because I'm not sure if people, if that's something that people necessarily think through, but until we got to the 504 plan, that was not something that our school had planned out. Um, and the last thing, this was not a uh, part of our 504 plan, but I was very happy our school principal made a blanket rule, no food in classroom for celebrations. You're allowed to, and which I just think makes it more inclusive for everybody. There's all sorts of dietary restrictions, preferences. Um, and so that to me, I thought was great. Well, thank you both. I can't, I can't say enough about how, you know, wonderful and uplifting I think this is. And I think at the root of kind of everything that we're talking about here is resilience. And I think that you know, people with food allergies and kids with food allergies are learning each day how to be resilient. So I really thank both of you for sharing your insights. Um, thank you all for coming. And again, join us April 19th, um, 1 p.m. Eastern. We'll be doing um, No Appetite for Bullying, which uh, will focus on bullying in the food allergy population. So thank you um, and have a great rest of the day. Thanks, Sarah and Ashley. You're welcome. Bye, everyone. Bye.